Well, good morning again, and happy Sabbath. I am excited to be here. I've been enjoying my time so far. Um, who's here this morning that was not here last night? How many of us are here that weren't able to make it last night? Okay, a few of us. Good, good. Okay. just helps me to know what other stories I might be able to repeat and things of that nature that might be of benefit throughout uh, my presentations today. Uh, today's message is entitled, uh, The Greatest Knowledge. You'll notice I actually changed my presentations. You have to forgive me. I have a bad habit of doing this. Um, I wasn't even supposed to share my testimony at all this weekend. Um, and so I, uh, after spending some time at breakfast the previous morning, I decided to share my testimony after talking with some individuals. And so I hope that was a blessing, um, and I've readjusted some of my sermons in lieu of that. And so uh, we will talk about what would have been presented this morning, this afternoon, though. So you will still hear that presentation. Uh, with that, uh, please bow your heads with me as I ask God to be with me, uh, for it's ultimately Him that speaks through us. Amen. My gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much uh, for the privilege to be able to share uh, from your word with my new friends, uh, my brothers and sisters who I did not know until this weekend, uh, but they were still brothers and sisters indeed. And I, I ask like I always ask, I pray that your spirit would be keenly felt, uh, that his voice would be distinctly heard, uh, that I would not be seen nor heard, uh, but that as we read the text of inspiration, uh, that our hearts would be moved, our minds would be open, and that the Spirit of God would so move upon us to give us an experience, uh, to give us a revelation of truth, a revelation of Christ uh, that we need for ourselves from where we're at. Only you can reach so many minds in so many ways through one text of Scripture. And so be the teacher and be the guide. And as you promised in your word, uh, teach us, Lord, for you said they will all be taught of God. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Our opening text is found in 1 John chapter 5, verse 20. 1 John chapter 5, verse 20. All the text will be on the screen, but I do encourage you to follow along in your preferred uh, translation that you have. Uh, the screen is for those who maybe don't have uh, a Bible with them available today. 1 John chapter 5, verse 20. The Bible says something very interesting that I read one day, and it really struck a, a note with me. It says, And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us what? An understanding. Now pause right there. I want you to think about this. If I were to just come and quiz you and ask you, why did Jesus come? What would you have said? To die for us? Very good, right? What else would you have said? To save us? Good. Uh, to heal, did he come to heal the sick? Yes, to set the, cap, the captivity, uh, the captives free, right? He did all these things. Jesus came to do a lot of things, but I believe all these things could be summarized in one thing. He did many things, wonderful things, beautiful and essential things that I think 1 John 5.20 summarizes in one concept, an understanding. He came to give us an understanding. Not of math, not of physics, Though you feel like you need to be a physicist to understand things like the 2300 day prophecy sometimes. But it's, he came to give us an understanding that we may what? Know him who is true. The entire mission and purpose of Christ was so that we could know God. To me that is fascinating. That, that, that concept. That when he was healing the sick, it was so you can know God. When he was answering prayers of people, it was so you could know God. When he raised the dead, it was so you could know God. When he died upon the cross and was resurrected, it was so you could know. Yes, it did many other things, but primarily he wanted you to know God. Why was it so important that we know God? Is it that important that we know God and have a knowledge of God? That's what we're going to talk about today as we lay a foundation for today's presentations. We're going to look at this in three points. Number one, we're going to look at the importance of knowing God. Number two, we're going to look at the meaning of knowing God. And number three, the results of knowing God. So three simple things we're going to look at today. Number one, the importance. Number two, the meaning. And number three, the results of knowing God. So let's dive into our first concept, point number one, the importance of knowing God. What does the Bible say in relation to the importance of knowing God? John chapter 17, verse 3 is a very popular and a very famous verse. 
John chapter 17, verse 3 says, And this is eternal life. Now, when you think of eternal life, if I said this is eternal life, the, the, the natural inclination of what I expect to hear next is, this is eternal life, to live forever, right? That's what you would expect the text to say. But notice what the verse says. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Did you know eternal life can start today? For to truly have eternal life is to know God. So if you know God, what do you have? You have eternal life. Which means what if you do not know God? What do you not have? Notice what Hosea chapter 4 verse 6 says. My people are destroyed for a what? Lack of knowledge. Now you have to understand, when, when I first read this verse, like many verses which I first read, it scared me. You see, when I was a young person, I was not the sharpest tool in the toolbox. You know what I mean? Uh, I was the kid that barely passed through junior high by the skin of my teeth. In fact, I remember I had this nightmare when I was, it was the last year of my Christianity. I remember I had this distinct nightmare where I was standing before this judgment throne. I, I'd seen a play and it totally tainted my mind of what heaven's like. But anyways, um, as a kid, and I was before this big white throne and there's this big white angel and he said, what's your name? And I said, Anthony Wayne Baca. And he opened up this big book and he said, you passed your classes in Clement Middle School. Enter into the joy of the Lord. And I walked into heaven all happy, and I was in junior high, I remember this, and I didn't read the Bible, so I had no conception of what was true, so this is not true at all. Anyway, so I walked into heaven, and I'm sitting with my friends happy, and another angel went to that certain angel which spoke those things, and then he said, actually, did you know that he failed this particular class in Clement Middle School? And they said, bring him back. So they brought me back before this big white throne, and I stood there. And I, I, I asked, what, what is this? And they said, we noticed you failed this class and modified your report card to lie to your parents. And this was a true story, right? And I was like, oh no, I'm busted. And he said, you cannot enter into the joy of the Lord. He pushed a button, the floor opened, and I boom, went straight down this tube. And there's a big bright orange thing at the bottom and I was falling and screaming and I woke up. And I thought to myself, man, I really need to pass this class. When I first read this verse, you see, in high school, I was actually kicked out of high school um, and had to go to a continuation school um, and then had to work myself back into a regular high school and I passed by the skin of my teeth. And I said, my, I read this, my people are destroyed for a lack of, and I thought, there's no way I could be saved. I'm not smart enough. If God is going to destroy people for a lack of knowledge, then there's no way an individual like me, an illiterate, uneducated individual, could ever possibly Make it to heaven. Open your Bibles to Hosea chapter 4. If you're not already there, I'm going to read a verse that's not on the screen. Hosea chapter 4. It's an easy book to find. Go to Daniel and go right after the book of Daniel. So it's, that's a good one for Adventists to try to find in the Minor Prophets. Hosea chapter 6, excuse me, chapter 4. And I want to read a verse because the knowledge here being spoken of is not a knowledge of math or science or history or things of this, but it's a particular knowledge that was missing in the time of God's people at this time. It's chapter 4, verse 1. The Bible says, Hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel. For the Lord brings a charge against the inhabitants of the land. There is no truth or mercy or what? Knowledge of God. You see, the knowledge that was lacking here was not a knowledge of these areas of study, like I thought it was when I first read the verse, but it was a knowledge of who? A knowledge of God. You see, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God. And vice versa, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Now, it's not that they didn't have the opportunity. Notice what the verse goes on to say. Because you have, what's that key word? Rejected knowledge. Now, in order to reject something, it has to be yeah, presented or given. Cole Porters understand the word rejection, right? They, you, they can't reject you until you what? Offer the book. You know, that's why I love Cole Porting so much. It really just helped me to, I feel, enter into the experience of Christ himself. 
and to understand in a very small respect what Christ goes through in his own personal experience. When every day he knocks on the door of our hearts, and sometimes even us coal porters say no to him. Not everyone who says to me, Matthew chapter 7, continuing on the importance of knowing God. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Here in Matthew chapter 7, we have an interesting passage of scripture. And it's describing a group of people that do not get to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, th this group of people to me are fascinating because what do they call Jesus? Yeah, they call him Lord. So are these atheists? No, right? I was an atheist before. For those who were not here last night, I was an atheist before. And if you would have come to me at that time when I was an atheist and, and, and asked me um, if I would ever call Jesus Lord, my answer would have been no, never. An atheist wouldn't do that. These are not atheists. So if they call him Lord, then they are professed Christians. So what the text is in essence saying is not every professed Christian will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Let me bring it more close to home. Not every professed Seventh-day Adventist Christian will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whenever I read a verse like that in the Bible, I perk up a little bit. How about you? When, whenever I read a text like that, it, I think to myself, a red flag goes off in my mind. It says, Anthony, you should really pay attention to the words that follow this passage. It goes on to say, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven... Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? You know, I don't think a lot of us walk around um, necessarily casting out demons or uh, opening the eyes of the blind. Not saying that doesn't happen. That definitely does happen in this world. Um, but since maybe you haven't experienced that, let me reread re the verse in a slightly different way. Uh, Lord, Lord, have we not canvassed in your name? Have we not given many Bible studies in your name? Passed out pamphlets in your name? And planted a church near our college in your name? In other words, haven't we done so much for you? Is in essence what the people are saying in the text. Haven't we done all these things? Now, mind you, I, I understand why the people would probably be saying this. If, if the Lord told me, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven, immediately you're thinking of all the reasons why you should be able to enter the kingdom of heaven. And the first thing they did was not claim Christ's righteousness, but list their good, their good works. Look at all that we did for you. That obviously should earn us and merit us your kingdom. Notice what he responds to them. And then I will declare to them, I what? I never knew you. N notice what he says and notice what he does not say. I think this is so important. He says, I never knew you. He does not say, depart from me, you didn't have your 28 fundamentals memorized. He doesn't say, depart from me, you didn't have the book of Revelation fully understood. He doesn't say, depart from me, you were too low of a seller in the Cole Porter programs. That was my experience. I sold two books a day my entire like first summer. It was such a trying experience, but a wonderful one at the same time. You know, often we think that Jesus is going to say, I'm sorry, you cannot enter for so many other reasons than what the Bible actually says. He says, look, I'm going to say depart from me because I don't what? I don't know you. Now, that's an interesting concept. God not knowing you. Question, does God know everything? When I first read this verse, I had, again, had a lot of problems with verses when I first read them. I read this verse and I thought, well, how can that be the case? Doesn't the Bible say that he knows the number of hairs on my head? Uh, you know, the first time I read that verse, I actually attempted to count the hairs on my head. I wanted to know myself as well as God knew me. Literally went to the mirror and I started counting, got halfway, lost count, and I gave up. I said, no, I'll just let you know and I'll ask you later how many were there. And I figure as I get older, there's fewer and fewer, so it's going to be easier one day to figure that number out. You know, the Bible describes that God knows you better than you know yourself. The psalmist tells us that he has stored your tears in a bottle. Did you know that? He knows every tear that you've ever cried. I don't even, I can't even recount every tear that I've ever cried, but God can. Yet the Bible says that he will tell a group of people, I never 
knew you. This challenged my thinking on the word know in Scripture. It challenged my thinking because I, I thought to myself, well, I know the Bible doesn't contradict itself, and I know God knows everything, and God knows everyone, so then how can he not know a group of people? It must be I have a misunderstanding of what it means to know in Scripture. So our second point, we're going to talk about the meaning of no. So our first thought we saw, is it important that we know God, yes or no? Yes, it is of eternal importance that you know God. If there is one thing that you take away from your time here at Watch the Hills, I hope it is that every single student leaves knowing God, amen? I'm sure that is the desire of every faculty member above all else. I even tell my students in my classes at Souls West, I don't care if you fail all of my finals, as long as when you leave, you know God. Now, obviously, I want you to do both, by God's grace, amen? Pass my finals and know God. But at the end of the day, knowing God is of such a significant importance to the Christian, it should be top priority. But what does it mean to know in Scripture? Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. I also add some cross-references if anyone's taking note on the top that you can add to that. Genesis 4, verse 1 has an interesting verse that someone pointed out to me years ago uh, that I think is worth considering in trying to understand the significance of what it means to know in Scripture. Genesis chapter 4 Looking at verse 1, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, Now Adam, what's that key word? Knew Eve, his wife. Stop right there. This is Genesis chapter what again? Okay, chapter 4. In Genesis chapter 2, you had the creation of man. So you had Adam was made, right? And then you got put to sleep, rib taken out. God made Eve, he wakes up, wow, praise the Lord, right? Help me, wife. So he wakes up, has a wife, Adam meets Eve in Genesis 2. We don't know the exact amount of time that transpired, but obviously they were together, correct? You have Genesis chapter 3, they experience the fall together. After Genesis 3, you know, obviously they're removed out of the garden, we come to Genesis 4, and it says Adam knew Eve. Question, is this the first time Adam met Eve? No, they had already met. They had already gone through some interesting experiences together. And again, we don't know the exact amount of time that transpired from creation until the removal from the Garden of Eden. Uh, But we do know that some time obviously had transpired. So this isn't their first encounter. And notice what is the result of them knowing each other. It says, now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she, what's that key word? Conceive. What does it mean to conceive? It means to become pregnant. That's right. By the context, we know that this word to know doesn't mean merely to know about an individual. It's not like Adam saw Eve and said, whoa, what's your name? She says, I'm Eve. He says, I'm Adam. They shook hands and, you know, she conceived. (laughs) This word to know is describing an intimate and personal one-on-one experience that only happens between husband and a wife. I want you to grasp that thought. That to know in this context is to have an intimate, personal, one-on-one experience that is typically, that is actually reserved only for a husband and a wife. This is what it means to know. It is more of an experience than a head knowledge. I want to read to you from a Greek lexicon on the word uh, ginosko, which is the word to know, often used in the New Testament. It's the word specifically used in John chapter 17, verse 3, which we read earlier. Notice how it defines this word to know. To acquire information by whatever means, but often with the implication of what? Personal involvement or experience. Personal involvement or experience. It goes on in the same uh, dictionary to continue with the description. To learn to know a person through what? Direct personal experience. And this is interesting. Direct personal experience implying a continuity of relationship. In translating Gnosko in John 17, 3, it is important to avoid an expression which will mean merely to learn about Here, the emphasis must be on the interpersonal relationship, which is experienced. Isn't that a fascinating word? There are a a couple words in the New Testament that could be used to know someone or to know something. And this word is 
one that typically is used to describe more of a personal experience. Let me illustrate it because I think stories work better than dictionaries. Okay. How many of you, when you were young, when your mom was cooking, she told you, do not touch the stove or the oven because it's what? Hot. Anyone ever told that as a kid? Anyone ever challenged that as a kid? All right, I'm with you. So what ended up happening, I remember my mom was making some tortillas and some tacos and things like that, and I, she would always tell me, don't touch the stove because the stove is hot. Now, you have to understand, I, I had no sisters. There was four boys in the home. You know, so it was four boys, my dad, and it was always, you know, out of the four boys, who's the alpha, you know, boy out of the group? It was always a challenge. We're, we were literally like a year each, each apart. My brother's 32, I'm 31, the next one is 29 and 28. So we're like right there packed together. So we're, we're all around the same age, and it was a constant challenge of who's the, who's the man? Anyways, so my mom tells me this one day, and I decide to challenge this concept. And I walked over to the stove when she walked out of the kitchen for a quick moment, and I thought to myself, I'm going to show her that stoves are hot for girls, <laughs> but they are not hot for boys. So I walked over to the stove, and I remember I did a nice little countdown, three, two, one, and I flung my hand up on that stove. Well, it made direct contact with the pan that was on the stove, not just the stove itself. And what do you think happened? right? There was some uh, freshly cooked baca for dinner that night. Uh, <laughs> for those who know a little Spanish, you get it. <laughs> Anyways, it burned. And I remember screaming. I remember screaming because it burned so bad. And my mom came in the kitchen and you know how the moms get, right? They're half mad and half concerned. It's like, I'm going to whoop you. Are you okay? Don't you ever do that again? Oh, do you need anything? It's like one of them like bipolar moments when you're not sure what's going on and you're just crying and crying and apparently all I could say was I thought it was a boy you know I thought it was a boy and uh yeah I learned that the stove when I reached forth my hand and touched it that it was hot why do I share the story here's why I think that perfectly illustrates the difference between knowing and knowing could I have known the stove was hot before touching it yes or no Yes, I had an, a, a, a source of authority, a, a, a mother who had cooked for so many years, who obviously knew the stove was hot, who had told me the stove was hot, and I could have taken it just because she said so, and that was a pretty safe bet to go by the authority of just what she said. And I would have known it was hot because someone had told me. But to Gnosko that it's hot, I had to experience it myself. The moment hand met pan. I went from knowing to knowing. I went from a head knowledge to a personal experience. I went from just knowing in the general sense, I forget the other Greek word I would tell you, to gnosko. The Bible doesn't tell us to know about God. The Bible is calling us to taste and see for ourselves that he is good. To have a personal experience for ourselves and to not know because we've been told so, not told because we just observe so, but to know because I've experienced so. That is what it means to know God. So when God tells a group of people, depart from me, I never knew you, what he is saying is we have never had a personal experience, a continual relationship now, I think this is why the Bible says that our, 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 our creator, right, he is our husband. He desires to live in that relational experience with each and every one of you. And young people, isn't that what you want as well? I mean, when I remember when I first became a Christian, Seventh-day Adventist Christian, I remember the, some church members pulled me aside and said, you know, Tony, you should probably just slow down, slow down. You're making way too many changes, way too fast. You know, you're doing some things and you're trying to do something. Just slow down, ease into this thing. And I remember I looked at them, I said, look, I always had this challenge as a young person of seeing people who profess Christianity but not experiencing Christianity. I said, I don't want to be a professed Christian. I want to be a Christian. I said, when I read the word of God, I don't want to read about what God did in people's lives. I want to experience what God did in people's lives. I don't want to read about people being set free. I want to be set free. I don't want to read about people experiencing the joy of the forgiveness of, God's, of the Lord. I want to experience the joys of my sins forgiven. I didn't just want head, head knowledge. I, I wanted it to be real. Amen? You know, too often 
I've worked with so many young people, the challenge with young people is they observe so many people who aren't really seemingly experiencing the word of God. And they think it is mere head knowledge. Young people, you can experience the word of God for it is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It can come inside within and cause a transformation and live out a life through you that you would be surprised was even possible. This is what God is calling us to experience, to know him by personal relationship. Christ's object lesson says it this, this way, describing this group of people that, do, that say, Lord, Lord, they do not know God. They have not studied his character, so there is a head knowledge involved, but they have not held communion with him, the experiential part. Therefore, they do not know how to trust, how to look, and live. So here we are called to not just know about God, and yes, you do need to study to know about him intellectually. You need to obviously know his character, right? But then to commune and to have an experience with that very same God. What are the results of knowing God? What are the results of knowing God? You may be thinking, well, how can I do that practically? The next two presentations today are the practical of point two. How can I daily know God? So we're going to talk about that this afternoon. So make sure you come back to hear that. But what are the results when I experience a knowledge of God? 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. We're going to go there first. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 and 8 is a beautiful passage, often quoted, of, often partially quoted, I should say. Just a few words extracted from the verse. Uh, but the whole verse, I think, is worthy of consideration. It says here in 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 and 8, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and what? Interesting. Knows God. You see, once you understand this concept, you reread the Bible, it's scattered all from Genesis to Revelation, this, this idea of knowing God. He who does not love does not what? Know God. For God is? That's so interesting to me. Hear this passage describing that everyone who is born of God, those who are born again, know God. Hmm. So if I don't know God, well, I'll let you draw your conclusions. It's kind of hard to experience being born of God because those that are born of God know God. How many of you would like to have more of God's love in your heart? It says in verse 8, he who does not love does not Know God, for God is, implying that if you know God, what will you have? Yeah. There seems to be this correlation with when you know God, becoming like God. Interesting, huh? This interesting correlation of knowing God equals becoming like God. Notice what John 14, verse 15, Adventists, you, you probably have this all memorized. We know this verse very well. If you love me, what? You'll keep my commandments, right? We, we like that. We like that verse a lot. But please notice the first part. If you what? Love me. If people do not love God, they will not, and might I add, cannot keep his commandments. Because he says, if you love me, then you will keep my commandments. But how can I have love? Well, knowing God. When I know God, I, I, I experience and receive his love. And when I love, have his love and love God, then I keep his commandment. Life transformation completely stems from knowing God. How many of you want to have a character more like Christ? How many of you actually want to obey the commandments of God? You know, the desire of ages describes how we can come to the experience where uh, when we, carry, when we car uh, carry out our own will and impulses, we are doing the very will of God. Read the paragraph. Go, go, go uh, ask me afterwards. I'll find it. I didn't prepare it for this. But she describes how your very day-to-day -day carrying out your impulses could be doing the very will of God, and this stems from knowing, knowing God. Do you know God? Because when you know God, you will become like God. We love him because he... First love thus. If you want a deeper love for God, meditate on the love that he has for you. Meditate on the sacrifice of Christ every single day. Every single day, spend a thoughtful period of time contemplating and meditating 
on Christ's life, especially those closing scenes. It's a beautiful concept that we throw around, but I don't know how many of us actually practice it. But when you practice it, life changes. I promise you, life changes when you spend time every day meditating on the closing scenes of life, Christ's life and what he gave for you. And when you realize he did this, all simply because he loved you. Even while you were his enemy, he did this for you. And as we behold his love, and as we meditate upon his love, we then love him in return. It creates a love within. And when we love him, we desire nothing more than to please him. And that creates a commandment-keeping people. And it, it, dare I say, this is what will give birth to the 144,000. They will simply be, in my definition, a group of people that know God as it is their privilege to know him. Do you know God? Not about God. Don't misunderstand. Do you know him? 2 Timothy 4 verse 8 describes the type of people that Jesus is coming to take home with him. Notice this verse and the type of people that he is coming to give an everlasting crown to. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and we're going to be reading verse 8. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8. The Bible says, Finally, oh, actually, way I hear a lot of Bible store churning. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. The Bible says, Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who what? Love his appearing. That's, is that an issue way to describe it? Not to all who know he's coming, not to all who can preach on the second coming, not to all who have all the text, the proof text memorized on the coming. He's coming for those who love his appearing. Question, do you love the fact that Christ is coming? Don't answer, just think to yourselves. I like people to think, but not to necessarily speak out loud all the time. You know, when I read this verse, I really had to ask myself and question, do I really love the fact that he's coming soon? Or do I love the prospect of having a family more than seeing Jesus? Yeah, I want Jesus to come, but let me have a family first. Then he can come. Let me finish that degree first. I mean, he obviously, you know, can't come before I become that MD that I've always wanted to be or that MDiv that I, I've desired to become or that MBA or CPA or whatever the case may be. Obviously, you know, that's got to happen first. Then he can come. You know, there is danger in that thinking. My buddy had a dream. He was an mi overseas missionary. He was a dentist. Now, can dentists make good money in America? Yeah, they can make good money, right? So he's overseas as a missionary. He had some children. They were raised as missionary children. And uh, the story was shared with me one day. They were planning on coming back to America. They had served a significant amount of years overseas. I almost said where it's at. I shouldn't say it, but overseas at a particular location. And every time they would come home for, like, holidays or to visit friends and family, his children would see the other dentists you know, that were in America, and the things that they had. And they would always complain, Dad, when are we going to come back to America? When are you going to work here? When are we going to have this house, these toys, these things? Well, eventually he, he made the decision because his kids were entering a particular age and were going to go to uh, higher education and wanted them to go here, and he was going to come back here. And he always had this dream house that he was going to build. He knew the house that he was going to have. Anyways, he's nearing the time when they're going to come to America, and he had a dream. And in the dream, he was building this house. And people would walk, would walk by and say, I almost said his name again, mercy, Lord guide my tongue. So they'd walk by and say, brother so-and-so, um, have you heard the Lord is coming soon? Yes, I have. Praise the Lord, he's coming soon. Yes, we'll see you when he comes. And keep, they would walk by and he'd keep building, right? Kind of like that time lapse in Sabbath school, just building this house. Another guy would come by, brother so-and-so, have you heard? The Lord is coming soon. He said, yes, I know he's coming soon, and I cannot wait to see him. Awesome. And he looked back to his house. And long story short, a few more people passed. Eventually, he finished the house, and he's looking back. He's like, man, whew, I finally did it. 
And all the people at the same time walked by and say, Brother so-and-so, have you heard the Lord has come? And he looked at them and said, No, he's coming soon. Because I had to finish the house first. And they're walking by and say, Brother, come with us. Like, look, he's here. Like, look up. He's here. We go to meet him. He's right there. And they're walking by, pleading with this man. Come, like, look. Like, just look up and you'll see him. He's right there, and he's looking at the houses. But, but I just finished. Surely I should enjoy the house first. He cannot have come. And they said, brother, come with us. Why do you not come? And they walked out of, the, out of view in the dream. And he just stood there staring at this house. And then he woke up. Needless to say, when he came to America, he didn't build the house. <laughs> You know, often, it's easier, it's easy to say that we love his appearing, but in our hearts, to actually love other things more than his appearing. Do you love his appearing? Do you long to see him face to face? If not, I say this cautiously, that's okay. That's called human nature. What you need is a deeper knowledge of God. You need a deeper experience with God so that you have a deeper love for God, that you will come to a point when everything else in this world will simply fade away in comparison to the thought of hastening the second coming of Jesus Christ. Amen? I read this quote last night, Ministry of Healing. A knowledge of God alone can make us like God in character. Transformation of character, purity of life, efficiency in service, adherence to correct principles, all depend upon a right knowledge of God. This knowledge is the essential preparation both for this life and the life to come. There is nothing more important to you as a Christian than, as Proverbs chapter 2 says, finding the knowledge of God. How do you find it? Where is it at? Daily, how can I experience that? Come back this afternoon to our presentations. We're going to talk about that. To me, it's my greatest burden and desire that people know God above all else. To summarize, our first point, we talked about the importance, the eternal importance of knowing God. Our second point We saw that to know God means to have our own personal experience and continual relationship with him. Not just knowing about him, but actually experiencing him. And number three, as we get to know God, that our lives would completely be changed to be more like the life of Jesus himself. That you cannot get to know God without having significant, significant results take place in your life. I'll be sharing some more stories this afternoon as well on some of the experiences I went through that on my journey of just getting to know God without trying to make any significant changes in of myself, some powerful um, deliverances that took place. To close, I want to share a concept. In Luke 13, 25 to 27, it says, describing the same group of people, when once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door, And you begin to stand outside and knock at the door saying, Lord, Lord, open for us. And he will answer and say to you, I don't know you where you are from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. You know, as I close and as we look at this concept, I read this verse and was confused one day. Because to know God means to have a what again? Yeah, it's like an experience, a relationship, right? It's a personal, tangible experience with this God. But here the people are saying that they ate and drank where? Yeah, in his presence and that he taught where? In their streets. Doesn't that sound like they had an experience with God, yes or no? I remember I read this verse one day and I was completely, completely confused. I thought to myself, well, that means I don't understand anything like normal. So I thought, okay, I'll just pray to God and keep reading the Bible. And one day, I believe God gave the answer that I needed for this text. It was in Revelation 3.20, my favorite book. Jesus said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and what? 
dine with him or sup with him, eat with him, and he with he with me. Jesus says, look, I stand at the door and I knock. Did you know this morning when you woke up, there was someone waiting for you? Did you hear the door knock? You know, sometimes we have the TV, spiritually speaking, up too loud. We have too many things that we've cluttered and put in front of the door that the, the, do- the knock has become f- so faint it's sometimes hard to hear because we've ignored it for so long. But know for certain this morning someone was knocking at the door of your heart. Every day he knocks. Did you hear? And if you heard, did you open? For if you open, the promise is, the guarantee is, he will come in and dine with? Let's look at Luke 13 again. You will begin to say, we ate and drank where? In your presence. Young man, could you come up on stage really quick? Yeah, you. Yeah, you. You look real sharp. You got that vest on? You look look like you were ready to come up on stage today. What's your name? Joshua Anthony. Awesome. Joshua, what's your favorite food? Korean food. Korean food. Oh, man, we need to hang out some more. All right. (laughs) Imagine your favorite food, whatever it is. Me and Joshua... We're eating your favorite food in front of you right now. And for him, it's Korean food. So he gets to enjoy Korean, but it changes. Whatever is your favorite food, we're eating it right now. And you're eating your celery sticks right there, watching us eat your favorite dish of food. And we're eating, we're enjoying, we're having a good conversation. We're interacting with one another. Question, could you say that you're eating and drinking in our presence, yes or no? You can. Can you say that you ate with us? Go ahead and have a seat. Thank you for being willing. The group of people, notice what they're saying. We ate and drank in your, we were around you, but we actually didn't eat with you. It's equivalent to saying, Lord, Lord, uh, I I, I mean, it says you taught in our streets, but it doesn't say you taught me. You could be in a spiritual environment where everyone in that environment knows God. And everyone's walking with God. And doesn't it just make you naturally more spiritual to be around people that are walking with God and know God and they're sharing their personal devotions all day and you're just thinking, oh man, I just feel so much more spiritual because I'm with all these spiritual people, right? You know, it's one of the dangers of Cole Porter programs and Bible colleges and Christian schools like this. It's so easy to ride on the coattails of someone else's experience with God. And to say, but, but God, I went to that college and you were all over the place on that, that college. I know you were there. I, I heard your voice all over the place. And he says, yeah, yeah, but every time I knocked on your door, you didn't open. It's not good enough that your faculty know God. It's not good enough that your parents know God. It's not good enough that your roommate knows God and keeps sharing with you and can't stop sharing it with you. I know what those roommates are like. I had one. Do you know God? Personally, for yourself, have you opened the door and spent time with him, commune with him, and allowed him to commune with you. That is what he's looking for. Please, don't fall into the trap of being content with just being around people who commune with God. But gain the experience for yourselves. You are privileged to be on this campus. You are privileged. I've interacted with people on this campus, and I thought, man, this is like the school of the prophets here. I love it here. You are privileged at people who love the Bible, who love Jesus at your disposal. You are privileged at a place where it's easy to be still and know that he is God. Take advantage of it. Leave this place knowing God because you have had the personal experience with him for yourself. The ten virgins. Some of the foolish woke up and they went to the wise and said, give us of your oil because we don't have any And they said, no, we can't give it to you lest we run out our, you can't have what I have. You have to have your own. You can't have my personal experience. Last night, my testimony, hope it was powerful. Hope you're blessed by it. But that's my testimony. It's not yours. But God wants to give you your own. The foolish try to go and get for themselves after it's too late. And notice what Jesus says to the foolish when they come. He says, Assuredly, I say to you, I don't what? There it is again. I don't know you. 
The foolish virgins tried to gain and to glean from others' experiences, but they needed to have it for themselves. Describing this group of virgins, my last quote, the class represented by the foolish virgins are not hypocrites. They're not what? They're not hypocrites. They have a great regard for the truth. They have advocated the truth. They're preachers. They are attracted to those who believe the truth, but they have not yielded themselves to the Holy Spirit's working. They do not know God. They have not studied his character, have not held communion with him, therefore do not know how to trust, how to look, and live. Their service to God degenerates into a form. I pray that would be no one's experience here on this campus, but that your experience with God would be a living and a vibrant one and not just forms and ceremonies. It's time we go back to the Bible. It's time we open up those sacred pages. Spend time beholding the cross, meditating on the closing scenes of Christ's life, the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world, to know him, to get to know him for who he is, that we might be ready when he comes in the clouds of heaven to take us home. How many of you, that's your desire, amen? Amen. Come back this afternoon as we talk about the practicality of how to make that practical in your daily life. Father in heaven, thank you for the chance that we had to study, to think, I pray, Lord, that right now that your spirit would be speaking to the the minds and the hearts of every individual present. It's so easy, Lord, to wear a mask in this Christian world that we live in and for no one to know around us what's truly going on on the inside. To have on, as it were, the white robe and to have the lamp in our hands and to walk around but to be destitute of the oil, destitute of your spirit, destitute of a personal living experience and relationship with you. I pray that no one in this room would try to quote unquote fake it till they make it, Lord, but that they would just come and be broken in the hands of Jesus and that they would come and cry out to you and that you would hear and answer and commune with them and give them their own personal experience with you that they might know how to trust, how to look, and how to live and to be ready to see Jesus when he comes in the clouds to take them home. Please bless us to this end. In Christ's name we pray, amen.